Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me in this webinar that is going to look at research excellence framework, learning from the past 10 years of impact assessment. We're delivering this webinar as part of Monash University Research Week, and we're delighted so many of you could join us. I'd like to start the session by officially acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, whose unceded lands I join you on. I pay my respects to elders, past and present, and also extend that respect to all First Nations people across Australia. Before we get started, a little bit of housekeeping. So we will be recording this session and it will be available um, at a later date. Please keep yourself on mute. And if you do have any questions, pop them in the chat. We'll be having a Q&A session at the end. Okay, so as I said, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, my name is Ellie McShady and I'm the research manager at Turning Point, which is Australia's leading addiction treatment, education and research centre. As an organisation, Turning Point brings together Monash Faculty of Medicine academics with Eastern Health clinicians to address the stigma associated with addiction to help improve the outcomes of those who are experiencing substance misuse. So I am delighted to be able to introduce three fabulous speakers today, particularly Simon and Jed, who are joining us from the UK. Um, it's quite late there, so thank you so much for joining us. During the course of the next hour, we're going to explore REF, Research Excellence Framework, and which has been a key driver in evaluating the impact of research in the UK. Our speakers are going to explore the data that has been gathered from these assessments and how that has been utilised to um, sort of impact the funding landscape as would. We'll also be exploring what lessons can be learned in an Australian context. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Simon Carriage. Simon has um, over 30 years research management experience. He has previously led uh, the research offices at the University of Kent and Sunderland. Simon is now the principal consultant at Carriage Research Consulting, and he has a passion for research management and administration as a profession and leads the INORMS, which is the International Network of Research Management Societies, or oh, there's so many acronyms in this, um, RAAAP, Research Administrators as a, as a Profession Task Force, that is collecting longitudinal data about our profession. I, for one, am really grateful about that sort of focus on research management as a profession, which is really changing the landscape for the people who work in that area. Simon was given the 2022 Innovation Work, uh, Award from the Canadian Association of Research Administrators for his work leading that group that is looking into research administration as a profession. The, a, uh, the RAAAP results will also play a major role in the Emerald Handbook of Research Management and Administration around the world, which is a book that will be shortly in press, and you can get it from all good booksellers, and I believe it may be on Amazon. Wonderful. Okay, over to you, Simon. This is what I look like. Um, there are a plethora of uh, acronyms there. I'm happy to discuss any of them afterwards. I guess the important one is the the REF 2021 uh, Panel C Advisor. Um, I was uh, involved in the assessment process for the most recent REF in the UK. So maybe that's one of the reasons why I was invited here. Or it could be because I look like James Bond. Um, yeah, maybe. Uh, that's what I used to look like pre-COVID with the beard. And that is what my wife thinks I look like. But more importantly, more dogs. Okay, so um, just to, a sort of reminder of how uh, UK universities are are, are funded. Uh, if you can see my mouse, we are here the uh, sort of horrible greeny sort of colour in the middle, um, and with this funding from all sorts of places, as you might imagine. Um, I guess the important thing here is this QR element, uh, and this is what is produced by the REF scores. So depending on what your REF score is, the institution gets a, a different amount of QR, and then that's fixed until the next REF period, and we get an, an annual annual amount. This is roughly two billion pounds, so about four billion US, uh, US four billion uh, Australian dollars, um, and that's about a quarter of the UK university's research income, not not the whole income, but the, the, the R&D income. So that's just to give you a, an idea of the importance, if you like. Um, the purpose of the REF is actually quite interesting. A lot of people do forget about these. So I, 
this is probably the only slide I'm going to to, to read out. So it's to inform this research funding uh, allocation. Um, it's not known beforehand what it's going to be. There's a formula uh, based on the on results, and that drives that QR that I mentioned. It's also to provide accountability for public funding of, of research and to demonstrate its benefits. So that again, that's one of the reasons why why impact was uh, was brought in, um, and to provide benchmarks and reputational uh, yardsticks. Um, hopefully, not put into too many league tables, but uh, you know, at least it gives you some idea about how how strong various subjects are in various institutions. Um, ref was for uh, ref impact was first introduced in the uh, the 2014 exercise. I'm not going to bore you too much with the details, but you can see it was worth 20% uh, of the whole exercise. So that's about uh, 400 uh, million pounds in funding each year across the sector. So yeah, it's not an insignificant uh, amount. Um, and I'm sure most of you know there are about 7,000 impact case studies. They're all available online and you can read them. And that's from the, from the 24th, um, sorry, sorry, from the REF uh, 2014 uh, exercise. Um, I'm not going to go too much into the details. I'm just going to skip over most of these slides, but they're, they're here for you later on. But just to give you an idea of the, the whole of the information that's submitted, lots of information about staff, lots of information about research outputs, so publications, uh, the impact uh, case studies, and uh, the environment. So maybe the culture of the department, if you like. Um, you then get a score based on those outputs, based on the impact and based on the environment. But it's not a score, it's a profile. So it's difficult to make lead tables out of. And again, you can see the, the sort of the various values of those. And it's those numbers which are sort of put into a machine uh, to calculate how much funding you get. And we can go through the details if, if needed, but not in an overview. Um, we do have a, a definition of impact, and notwithstanding what a, a number of people will say, maybe Jed will, 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 will come in on this, um, it, it hasn't really changed. There has just been some sort of slight nuance changes. It's basically any effect outside academia, but specifically outside the teaching and learning of the, your own institution. So anything else um, is, is fair game. Uh, in terms of the range of impacts, again, you know all about impact in, in Australia, so I'm not going to go through here, but it can be anything and everything. So that's kind of when it was introduced, 2014, everyone was really scared, especially as we weren't told about it until 2016, and so it was uh, all, all exciting putting those case studies together. Um, for the uh, most recent exercise, which has been undertaken, the 2021 exercise, um, impact value increased from 20% to 25%, um, which was the initial suggestion from government. So uh, that's now half a half a million pounds worth of, of funding that which it drives each year to, to UK universities. We are now planning for REF 2028, which may or may not become REF 2029. Who knows? Uh, delays, delays happen. Um, Impact uh, stays at 25%, although technically impact case study value has gone down because they're reintroducing the impact template, which is very similar to what you have in Australia, which is a, dis a description or one of the things you had in Australia, a description of how that support um, uh, for impact is is run through the institution and through the department and then case studies which have sort of benefited uh, from that support. And I'm sure we can go into, into more details on that. Um, I, I put a, a yellow arrow there for pe people, culture, and environment. The big change coming forward is going to be this this research culture. So it is how do you support everybody, everybody in the department, not just uh, academic staff. So we can maybe talk about that later on because that does have a, a bit of an impact on impact. Um, there's a consultation going on at the moment. Uh, things are sort of uh, changing. I'm not going to go into too much detail about those, but those are those are there just for information in case people want to to ask questions uh, about them. But it's very much decoupling um, the research from individuals and making it um, anything to do with the department uh, uh, as a whole. So. Uh, why do we need impact uh, assessment? Uh, for those of you who haven't seen this report, it's well worth looking at. It's uh, from, from 2019, so a few years ago now, uh, based on uh, the uh, sort of work leading up to the previous exercise. Um, it's one of those large round reports, so um, I'd recommend looking at that uh, uh, if you haven't had a look. I can't go through the detail of it, but uh, probably the thing to pull out is trends for the future. Um, so this is in order for the 
specifically for, for UK uh, researchers to try and make the best of whatever they might be required to do in the UK environment uh, going forward. Um, so collaborating with other academic researchers, not a surprise. Collaborate globally with other academic researchers, also not a surprise. Focus on multidisciplinary research, more likely to have impact because it, it's sort of bigger, if you like. Um, focus on research integrity, and that's something that's becoming very very important in, in, in the UK and a, a drive towards open science. And some of those things are sort of um, at attention uh, with, with impact. So, so, so it can be interesting. Anyway, take a, take a look at that report. There's lots in there uh, about impact as well. I am quickly going to show you uh, my favorite um, chart from uh, Ref2014. If anyone ha hasn't seen it, it's basically the type of impact that your research has is sort of related to the research area, but it can move anywhere. Um, this is probably an easier uh, one to look at. I know you can't um, see them, uh, the, the, the names, but again, they're in those reports. This is the subject area that produced the impact, and this is the type of impact that it is. So sort of the medicine ones here produce sort of health-related impacts, but all over the place, but also sciences and social sciences and arts also produce some, some medical uh, type impact. So again, like nothing surprising there. Um, we're quickly going to do uh, impact of impact. I'll see if I can explain this slide. This is um, the distribution of sizes of submissions. So you can select the number of people that you want to submit and, 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 and therefore how much research is. And you can see that um, any size ending in a zero, so this is 10 or 20 or 30, this is 21 or 31 or 41, it's kind of getting a little bit lower as you go. Um, and that was for the 2008 exercise before we had impact case studies. Um, no, I've just said that. Uh, if we add in uh, the distribution for 2014, first time we had impact case studies, um, there was a threshold at 15 uh, FDE, uh, which is if you had less than 15, you needed two case studies. And if you had uh, more than 15, then you needed three case studies, more than 25, four case studies, and so on. Uh, so you can see that most the, the, the most common submission size was just below the threshold needed for that additional impact case study. Um, and it was all new. And so this is the reason why, and everyone said it's all fine. But if we look at the data uh, from the most recent submission in 2021, when in theory, everybody is being submitted, there was no selection. Um, this is the, uh, in, uh, the the peak of just below the case study, just after the case study, the next one needed, and so on. So you can see um, that uh, the requirement of the assessment actually really drives the shape of departments and submissions. So again, something, something to be potentially worried about there, I would guess. Um, okay, um, that's just the same thing. Um, seven times more likely to be just under the threshold. Okay, so I'm not going to talk too much about um, uh, research culture, but um, just saying that uh, let's say there's a big push and uh, having a great understanding of the importance of research culture in underpinning excellent research with wider societal impact. So how does everybody contribute to um, supporting and developing? So don't, don't just think about your academic staff, uh, think about all other staff. So technicians, librarians, research managers, administrators, uh, uh, and so on. And if anyone wants to have a look at the Hidden Rest Festival, again, I'll talk about that later on, but that was a celebration of things which weren't submitted to the REF, even though they were very good, but were perhaps not REFable. Um, Okay, that's more or less my time up, I think, uh, other than I now have my shameless plug for the book, uh, which Ellie Valley very kindly um, uh, mentioned. Uh, it will be available from the 29th of November to purchase £115 or whatever in, U uh, in Australian dollars is. Uh, but it is, of course, open access and free to download. So you only have to pay if you want the printed copy. So um, uh, enjoy yourself. It's 832 pages of uh, pure joy. Uh, there are even uh, some uh, uh, pages, uh, some pages, some chapters um, about the history of research management in Australasia and uh, also in uh, the current state in Australia and, and New Zealand. Um, so uh, there you go. Um, that is me done. Uh, there's my contact details, uh, more dogs, and uh, oh, did I mention the book? So uh, that's me done. Uh, I will stop sharing and we can uh, move on. Wonderful. Thank you for that whistle-stop tour, Simon, of the history of REF. 
I, I, I really want to go and Google the Hidden Ref uh, Festival and find out what was good, but not quite refable. Um, so yeah, I will be doing that. Thank you. So we are going to hand over to our next fabulous speaker now, Dr. Jed Hall. He has worked at 20 years um, in senior levels in higher education sector in the UK. For the past 12 of those years, he's focused on research impact and his work has been included in organisational development projects, um, which have reported to executive level um, and professional development of individual researchers and groups at all career levels. Um, he's also co-author co of the Engage for Impact strategy and is now heavily involved in its implementation across the whole of the University of Leeds. He also, with other colleagues from the University of Leeds, produces the research uncovered um, so I'll say that again, Research, Culture and Covered podcast, which again, I did Google and is available on all places that you get podcasts and has a huge back catalogue of six series that look absolutely fascinating. So I would definitely encourage you to check that out. And with that, I am going to hand over to Jen. Thank you. Well, many thanks, Ellie, for the invitation to talk to people this this morning for you and, and this evening for me and Simon. And, and and again, the shameless plug for the Research Culture Uncovered podcast. Simon's got a book. We've got a podcast. Um, <laughs> and uh, one of the episodes recently was about the Hidden Ref. So if that, if that uh, uh, piques your attention, you can have a listen to Gemma Derrick. Um, a fellow Australian who is uh, who is one of the organisers uh, of the Hidden Ref. Um, so as it's the evening for me and it's way past my bedtime, I hope this presentation hangs together coherently. It's probably the first time I've presented at this time of night. Um, but I'm going to kind of follow on from Simon's overview of impact in the UK context <clears throat> by discussing some of the lived experiences at my own institution, the University of Leeds. Um, so firstly, I'm going to uh, briefly uh, talk about the university's current strategy, which I think makes us one of the most impact focused institutions in the UK. And then I'm going to mention some co concerns and critiques about impact. You know, Simon hinted at some of those, so I'll kind of uh, uh, bring a few more to the table. And that's that's from Catherine Smith's book, uh, which is called The Impact uh, Agenda, uh, Catherine Smith and others. Um, I also wanted to highlight actual lived experiences, so how our academics and, and research support people actually deliver the process, you know, deliver impact case studies into, into REF 2021. So I'm going to talk about examples from that submission. So three of those are kind of cautionary tales, uh, and one of which is really positive. Um, and finally, I wanted to try and wrap it all up all up in some, hopefully some form of learning for you um, that you might find useful. So our current 10 year strategy, which is called Universal Values and Global Change is very much impact led. For, in for instance, in its introduction, it states, we are highly focused on impact. It is our most important product, not money or profits, but making a positive difference in the world. So the, that's delivered through um, three overarching elements, uh, one of which is community, both inside and outside the organization. Um, a culture which is supportive and collaborative, and, and of course, impact, which is again exemplified by this sentence. We will be outward looking and focused on the needs of global and local populations to maximize our impact in all that we do. So I think the crucial thing to point out here is that we're not just talking about impact from research, but impact from all of the activities and all of the underpinning activities, even our financial investments. In the research and innovation enabling strategy for that corporate strategy, we've got, I picked out a range of actions here that we've got in that strategy. Um, so equal recognition uh, given to all forms of academic activity, not just outputs from, from academic work. Um, and this is part of ensuring that we've got that impact focused research model, which is fit for that future. You know, whatever, whatever the final decisions about REF 2028 and beyond. And, and I, I do try and whenever I'm talking about impact, I, I have a, a click in my head where if I talk about REF, 
that's 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 the success of the presentation going downwards and if it goes if i don't have that many clicks saying ref the success is going upwards so i'm going to try and avoid using that phrase from now on um so so it's all about trying to make sure we we play our part in addressing society's major challenges which again will require diversification of our research in income. That's not surprising. Most universities are trying to do that anywhere in the world, but we we couple that with so that it changes the depth and the breadth of the impact that we can create. Now, this focus on impact has really been part of the university's culture since its founding, which is quite similar to most of the red bricks or the kind of um, industrial um, revolution. Uh, cities of the north often um as well as the as well as the cities around you know kind of bristol and those sorts of areas too so often most of the red brick universities were created for that purpose um at the time and, and leeds is no different now of course there's always concerns and critiques of any movement or change and these 10 concerns as i've said come from uh, the impact agenda book by uh, catherine smith and, and colleagues I'm not going to, I haven't got time to talk about all 10. Um, you know, you can read the book. This is just from one chapter. The book goes into kind of lots of detail about how we might fix some of those concerns. But I'm going to talk about uh, five of them that I think are kind of quite important, three of which I'm linking together because they really generate burden. So one of those is demonstrating and attributing impact meaningfully measuring impact and of course the resources to do all of those things they all add burden to individual researchers in terms of developing the skills for all of this and the institution in terms of the cost of the process i guess you know kind of new roles coming along to be able to support researchers in doing this um as well as that, there's also the burden of, of the time horizon. So Simon didn't mention this, but the kind of time, 20 year time horizon between, um, between research occurring and impact happening that in that kind of very simple linear model, which is not really true. Um, you know, being able, being able to capture that and hold on to that, especially when, you know, researchers are humans and they change jobs just as often as as everybody else uh, changes jobs uh, and changes institutions so you know when when you have to do that with um you know the added burden of being able to do that and, and managing that process when people come and go um, the next issue um, that I wanted to pick out on is the assumption that impact is necessarily positive now I think we all know that impact is by its very nature subjective with the same impact potentially being seen as positive by one group and negative by another. Therefore, at the core of doing impact ethically and responsibly, you have to think about all those perspectives to minimise negative impacts and maximise positives. And if this goal, if this goal is impossible to achieve, at least to recognise all those voices and give them due respect. The final concern I wanted to pick out was the reifying of impact heroes and traditional elites. This can happen on both sides of the impact coin, the research side and the kind of user side. And it usually boils down to people having existing privileges. For instance, researchers who are further on in the career are likely to have both, both more resources in terms of grant income and social capital, as well as things like permanent contracts. Whilst on the user side, organisations, individuals or communities with greater resources are usually able to engage in co-productive work with researchers and therefore drive um, the research strategy and, and, and the impact that emerges from it. So I'd like to think about, uh, about how these concerns play out in, in real lived experiences. So this first example comes from our School of Geography. So the lead academic is very much an activist scholar. And the case study is actually about where he lives and how that community evolved and what effects it's had on other community-led housing schemes in the UK. I put the timeline on the slide, but rather than point out the intricacy of it, I just wanted to point out that research and practice are happening simultaneously. It's not 
research then follows impact in that assumed linear model that so rarely happens. Now, in writing the impact case study, the academic was concerned that there wasn't a clearly linear research through to practice through to impact chain. It took lots of reassurance um, that that linear model is usually a myth um, because the big issue for him was the time investment. You know, all of our, as Simon said, it's a high stakes um, submission, the ref, you know, what, what was it, Simon, for two billion pounds? That's that's a lot um, in any person's person's counting. Um, so it's high stakes. So it's really big investment of time, but not actually much return for the academic themselves. You know, it doesn't. It's not yet doing lots of things for for careers and things like that. Although that's starting to change um, through through the process. But he was worried about that regular update of the draft so we we probably had um review and and feedback probably annually and then becoming more often as the submission date gets closer that takes a lot of both effort in terms of the you know responding to it and the emotional effort of responding to it too so he was concerned that you know i'm going to put all in this effort in and are they just going to label it as unclassified because it just doesn't fit this silly linear narrative. Um, and that that took loads of work actually to convince him to go through the to go through the uh, the difficulties of that. Really because for him, the value of his re of his work, both research and impact, had all been already been realized through his home, the community, and influencing all those other communities that he'd uh, that he'd been able to do. The next example um, is also, it's interesting, it's also from the School of Geography. And in this case, uh, an academic generated data sets of ash deposits from across Europe, from volcanic uh, eruptions. And he was contacted out of the blue. So this is really serendipitous impact by a PI um, from a from a program that NASA were running to to essentially throw um, throw stuff into jet engines. You can see the picture and see if they still work and, and in what conditions they stop working. So these tests were already planned and a number had actually been conducted. And if you know how expensive a jet engine is, if you, um, if you stop one working, that's a few million pounds gone um, in one hit. Um, so really what the PI wanted to know was either are, are the, is the stuff that we're throwing in, is it the right size? You know, is it the right size distribution to properly mimic what you might fly through if a volcano um, erupts? Um, thankfully, they had chosen appropriate mix. So when they compared it to the data sets from, from across Europe that the, that the academic at Leeds had generated, and that allowed them to increase the confidence in what the test showed and allowed them to propose operating conditions for engines that were a lot less conservative than they would have recommended if they got the sizes wrong. So this serendipitous impact, certainly not envisaged or planned for, had the issue of only very emergent relationships with the stakeholders and then the re the lead researcher left the institution now this was really close to the submission so it really shouldn't have made much difference it's not like trying to remember what's happened from 20 years ago when somebody left uh, after uh, publishing a, uh, an article while they were at Leeds for instance but eventually it meant that you know the the final submitted draft had to be written by the school's director of uh, research, another academic, and, and the school's impact manager. Now, they did get lots of help from the academic who had left, essentially help in terms of negotiating the relationships, not helping uh, in terms of producing the text. But this collegiate approach was, uh, was no way under any obligation, but it did save this case study which essentially had to be submitted. I mean, if they hadn't hit, got that uh, case study right, they would have been one short than they, uh, the amount that they were required to submit. So there might have been lots of gaming about trying to take people out of that unit of assessment. 
The third example is also about burden. In this example, the researchers had significant engagement with lots of stakeholders around the issue of breakfast, so having eaten it or not when you're a child at school. These engagements had generated a significant amount of data, but the data hadn't ever been analysed through an impact lens. The analysis was driven by the research question lenses. The first draft was a, was a real narrative about the engagement with leaps of unevidenced logic for the impact claims. The issue here is that the research team had collected potential impact evidence, but because it wasn't analysed in that way, there was no reflection on what the actual impact claim could or should be and what further corroboration might be needed to support that claim. So essentially the team had heard, collect the evidence as you go, but had forgotten to do anything with it. Um, there was also a bit of a misunderstanding about what impact really means. Is it engagement, reach and significance, etc.? But actually that you need evidence for all of them, not just a bundle of engagement evidence, which is all they really had at the time. So lots of support was wrapped around the researchers to help to develop a plan to analyse the data to see if there was evidence for the claims that they were making. And then a further plan was created to cover the gaps in that evidence to, to kind of enforce it. Lots of tactics such as offering pieces of this analysis as projects within undergraduate programmes and also paid internships for students were used to do this legwork. And this was done really to remove the burden from the research team who again so no significant added value for them in doing this work. Thankfully, the analysis was really successful in the case that he went from being on the long list with no chance of being submitted to becoming one of the strongest for that unit of assessment psychology. Final one, which is uh, much more positive. Um, so this final example is about seek radicalization and helping policy actors to understand this community and develop policies that are driven by that understanding. The research, a good friend of mine, Jasjit Singh, moved into research after an early career as a systems analyst and database administrator in the utility sector. So, you know, fairly mid-life, actually, his move. He completed his PhD in 2012, and because his first block position was researching how arts disciplines could and should be more engaged with communities beyond the academy, impact has always been part of his identity as a theology academic. His case study is highly likely to have been graded as four, the highest, and therefore <laughs> attracting the most funding. Uh, and he is also pro dean for internationalization for his faculty and holds a prestigious visiting professor position at the University of Singapore. Another one of the postdocs on that same project that I mentioned has already been promoted to full professor, and I'd hope Jazz won't be too far behind. So what have we, the UK HE sector and Leeds, specifically learned from all of this? It's, it's no surprise that assessment changes behaviour. There are examples of REF changing it for the worst. So cynical academics looking to exploit relationships to get impact for their, for their benefit, e.g. promotion, um, and not really thinking about the stakeholders' benefits. And there are examples of burdens producing barriers to engagement that I've already mentioned and talked through with those lived experiences. Therefore, as a university, we have to think clearly about the types of behaviour we do want to encourage and how we value those behaviours. We are therefore doing considerable work on both our formal and informal recognition of impact-related activities at, at Leeds and the teams that are needed to deliver those activities. So that's not just thinking about um, the academics themselves, but beyond that. Another aspect of this impact must be uh, is that it must be values led, not only to minimise grim impact. Again, I'm going to reference Gemma Derrick here and her colleagues who came up with that term a few years ago, but also to shore up academic freedom and, and autonomy. At Leeds, we encourage those value conversations to happen in research groups, centres, and, and again at bigger schools such as. Uh, bigger scales such as schools, faculties and ultimately the university. And over time, what we want to, to happen is that the phrase, what impact does the university stroke funder want to disappear and be consciously replaced by 
what impact do we want to see as researchers and the research community around them? We then support those who have de developed that clarity. What impact do I want to see and, and help them to, to try and achieve that? Now, since I started at the university in 2011, um, just after the guidance for, um, for REF 2014 was published, so when we finally knew the rules um, for, of that particular game, in a role that I always framed uh, as impact, there are now many more impact-related members of staff than there were back then. These include colleagues in innovation and commercialization, policy engagement, public and patient involvement, research communication, and research impact evaluation. All these distributed people and the organizational expertise they generate need to be visible and accessible. We can't add more resource, Budgets in the UK are too tight and likely to get tighter. So we have to offset that by effective social capital amongst those colleagues that shares knowledge and is happy to cover beyond their core areas because they know that others will do the same for them in return in the future. And I think finally, the most important thing from my perspective is that we should banish REF and terms like, I'm glad Simon used it, REFable from the impact lexicon. Instead, we as an institution are valuing people for thinking about the types of impact they want to generate and then recognising and rewarding them to ethically and responsibly try to deliver those impacts. Recognition and funding through the REF is nice, but that's not our driver and, and we're trying to avoid it being our driver, consciously trying to avoid that. So hopefully that's been of some use to you and, and that's the smith book and and Gemma derrick's work and i'll stop sharing now wonderful thank you for that absolutely fascinating presentation jed um i have so many questions um which i will hold until the end if anybody <laughs> else has any questions please do pop them into the chat um and we will head over to our third and final presenter, Dr. Tamika Hyden, who is the principal and founder of the Research Impact Academy, which is a global organization based here in Australia that helps researchers and research organizations achieve their goals. She's a passionate advocate of research impact and has over 15 years experience in the field. Tamika began her career as a researcher in the field of health, but she quickly became disillusioned with the traditional approach to research, which she felt was too focused on publications and not enough on impact. After that, she left academia to pursue a, college, a career in knowledge translation, where she worked to bridge the gap between research and practice. In 2014, Tamika founded Knowledge Translation Australia, which has later been rebranded to the Research Impact Academy. The Academy provides a range of services to help researchers and research organisations achieve their goals. And that includes training, development, consulting, coaching, membership, and a whole host of events. I've been to a number of uh, Tamika's presentations, which have always been fascinating, and I'm sure this will be. So thank you very much, and over to you. Great. Thanks for the introduction, Ellie, and uh, welcome, everyone. Um, it's really interesting um, listening to, to Jed and Simon before this, and uh, and hearing you know their side and, and what I want to provide today is a real um just a, an overview a short overview of basically the thoughts in my head when I think about this um and some of the assumptions that we make some of the things that we can benefit from um and where we're kind of at at the moment um although we don't really know that and I will just say that if I had known that a shameless uh self-promotion was a prerequisite I would have prepared something um earlier but no no shameless uh one for me it's probably just all shameful let's just say uh okay so um let's delve in so first of all I will just say as an Australian and maybe uh, for many of you watching that we do sometimes have an assumption uh we shouldn't have this assumption but we do have an assumption that everyone in the UK is doing impact you know we hear all about the ref and we hear about impact and when I talk about the ref I'm talking just about the impact component but we sort of think, you know, they've got this wrapped up, they've been doing it, they've had these assessments, everyone must have this stuff sorted, they know what they're doing. But really, that is a massive assumption. And having done a bit of training and a bit of work with the UK over the last few years, I've realised that's not the case. So it's definitely not the case that they all do impact and have it all sorted. Um, but definitely way ahead of where 
we are, I believe, in terms of particularly the academics. One of the other things is that when it comes to impact, we have to really think about culture and culture really needs to be created. And I know that's come up by both Jed and Simon as well. Um, we, you know, if we want to change culture or we want culture of impact to be normal, then we have to have the mechanisms to do it. Um, and unfortunately, talking about it does not change culture. So there have to be drivers um, because of time and because of money and because of all the other factors that are going into this. So researchers are not uh, purely impact machines. They are research people. And um, we need to remember that impact is just the assessment of the great work they're doing, not necessarily an entire other role they need to be doing. Uh, so the other things we have to think about are things like skills and resourcing. So we need to be prepared. So having preparation of researchers and preparation of reviewers, it takes time to get it right. It takes time to put all the pieces in place. We need to take the time to build skills. In terms of dedicated roles, we, we're starting to see impact officer roles here a little bit. It's a bit smaller. Um, but without the external drivers of an assessment, of funding, of, of other elements, then these roles are not commonplace. And what we can see is often when organisations are coming under some sort of financial uh, scrutiny, they're the first roles to, to go because there is no driver for that mechanism. Um, we also need to think about training. We need to prepare in advance of any change if there is to be an assessment or we are to introduce something. Um, and we also need to think about the skills of people assessing impact. That's another topic. Um, most people who know me know that it's something that frustrates me a lot. Um, but it is something that I don't think we can rush into assessment without thinking about have we adequately looked at how does that assessment happen and who should be doing that assessment. The reward mechanisms that came up a little bit there um, when Jed was talking as well. So how does this assessment really help um, both organisations and individuals? So rather than just assessment for assessment's sake, which is what I think we really saw with the ARC. Um, there wasn't really much purpose to it when we had the engagement and impact assessment. People were asked to do it. I was actually amazed that people would do this for nothing. Um, I mean, there was really not even much kudos around it. Um, and we can't really learn from what was even done because the only case studies that were published publicly were um, the, the top ones. So we can't see what was good at versus what was bad. So it hasn't really been the learning that we could have used it for here in Australia. Uh, we also have the cost versus reward. So the cost to the university of doing it uh, versus the reward, in which case uh, we didn't have those kind of mechanisms, those reward mechanisms in place to really help an assessment that we've done in the past work. And I think if we are to do one in the future, these things need to be in place. I don't think it's something that can be announced and happen in the next two or three years, to be honest, I think we need time to build up to this. The other thing is just to mm -hmm. say that we already have an impact agenda. Um, people sort of say we don't really do impact or we, maybe we are, but anyone who is a researcher is part of an impact agenda, whether they are aware of it or not. Um, and that is because funding in this country requires that you either have had an impact in the past mm -hmm. or that you have really well outlined the impact you're hoping to achieve. So we do have an impact agenda here. Another element that we need to think about is the time. One round of assessment is not enough to judge whether it's working. If we're going to implement an assessment, we need patience. Um, we can't just do one round and cancel it because it was too much work. Um, we can learn that, I think, from the ref. In fact, you know, maybe it's good, bad or otherwise. They're continuing on and they're learning and evolving. And maybe, you know, in another couple of rounds, they'll go, no, that was the worst thing we ever did. Or maybe they won't. Um, but I think there are, you've got to give things time. You can't just change every time you feel like changing your socks. Um, so we also need to, you know, um, have that greater awareness and acknowledgement across um, the time it takes to have impact across the sector, the time to capture, to track, to evidence that, the time to write the case studies, the time to prepare the sector for any sorts of assessment that we're going to have um, before it sort of gets going. So there are benefits though, and I think we've, you know, from the REF, we've really seen what some of those benefits are. And they're things that really our Australian government is talking about. So bridging the gap between academia and industry is a really great benefit, drives innovation, promotes interdisciplinary collaboration, 
um, gives accountability of investment in research. And we work with a lot of nonprofits who are really interested in this area. We work with a lot of government agencies who want to know what's that return on investment for us. Um, and I think the public want to know that more and more now. We're seeing so much transparency around where money is being mm-hmm. spent. Um, and then the allocation. So really we've got that accountability, but the allocation decisions. So things like this can help to focus on where should money go. And I think if we have an assessment of impact, perhaps that drives more funding into research in the long term. So that could be um, more of a benefit if you like. And then there's the advocacy piece to how do we use those case studies to advocate for impact roles, to advocate for continued funding, to advocate for types of research. Um, So I think we can use that for all of those elements. And it's interesting because these are all the elements that are used to evaluate impact, um, but I think we need to use them to evaluate the benefits of an assessment. Now, we've got the accord happening in Australia at the moment, and uh, this is straight from the uh, interim report from the accord. And really, um, they're saying that the research strength of our universities should be protected and increased. Mechanisms for sharing and translating university research should be improved significantly, starting with establishing a baseline and continuing to measure how useful university research actually is to end users. Now, I think we have an issue And the issue I think we have is that we keep talking about metrics and measurement. And that is a serious issue because not everything can have a metric given to it. So the interim report talked about the 10 10 possible system shifts to improve Australia's higher education system. So it's generally about higher education. But the two points that were really uh, relevant to research were to reprioritize research, to strengthen its foundations, bring about widespread impact through translation and use. And it's great to say that, but how will we know it's happening? And a new approach to mission based comp- um, compacts and will address future planning, distinctive place based impact, and institutional governance responsibilities. One of the things that they said is that we need the development of a light touch automated metrics-based research quality assessment system. And I think, again, metrics-based, light touch, let's not go half-hearted. If you're going to do it, let's do it because you're going to disrupt an entire sector for a light touch and metrics, which won't be relevant to everyone. And that is because not everything that counts can be counted and not everything that can be counted counts. And I think we have to remember this. So when it comes to measuring um, and, the, and the review from the Accord, they're talking about quantifiable metrics, measures of impact um, and recommending those. They're talking about um, use of narrative CVs. So this is an interesting one. Um, so I think as much as quantifiable metrics are an issue, I think the use of the narrative CVs is an interesting one. Uh, they actually referred to the NHMRC as, as an example of that and the UK Research and Innovation. Uh, But one of the problems that we still have with that is, although it's been introduced and it was very sudden and not many people knew much about it, it's been poorly articulated and really it's been poorly um, planned out in terms of the review. Um, So I think, you know, it's one thing to have this uh, suggested narrative, but again, what are you going to do with it? How are you going to assess it? Um, How are you going to introduce it? How are you going to help people to do it? Um, These things take time. Um, And one thing I will say is at least... The introduction of that by, say, the NHMRC in this case has um, been held on to and they're doing it, continuing to do it, even though you would have thought after the first year they might have got rid of it. Um, So there is an opportunity to see how that works. But um, from my side of the fence, I don't see some of those things working um, at the moment. So um, I don't have a crystal ball. Um, I think we need to watch this space and um, hopefully that gives some food for thought in terms of where we're at in Australia. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Tamika. Um, I um, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but I may ask you to do a bit of future gazing anyway. Um, we do have a question in the chat. Um, while I ask that, I encourage anyone who has any questions or comments, please post them. Um, the first question we have actually really touches a lot on your final, well, one of your final points, Tamika, but this is a question to Jed and Simon as well. And about that metric metrics um, and whether you, the three of you feel that case studies are essential for assessing impact. 
in a sort of move away from solely focused on metrics? Would case studies reduce the burden? Um, really interested particularly to hear from you, Jed, because those processes seem incredibly long. Um, and also, um, could the REF evaluations have worked without the case studies? So basically, what do you think about case studies? Are they better than using sort of pure metrics? Um, and could have the REF evaluation of impact have worked without case studies? And I guess, do you have any other suggestions? Mm. Sh shall I go first? I, I can see you itching to talk. So yes, please. Yeah. So, so um, I think it's the best thing we've got at the moment. Um, I mean, in the UK, there's also <laughs> there's multiple excellence frameworks. So there's research, teaching, and there's a knowledge exchange um, framework too. The knowledge exchange framework is more metrics driven, um, and it was from metrics that were, were already collected through through the sector. Um, and to be honest. I don't think they tell us anything we didn't already know. And, you know, they wouldn't, they probably wouldn't have gone much further than those metrics if they had have gone down the metrics route, mainly because, you know, those metrics wouldn't have existed. If they'd have come up with a, with a new one, we'd have gone, where are we going to get that from? How are we going to generate it? So, so I think at the moment, um, impact case studies, the the narrative approach which does include evidence obviously um there has to be an evidence for every claim i talked about that in one of the uh, one of the lived examples so you know i think it i think for me it's the best we've got yeah and yeah if i can just jump in on that um reflect back on one of the my earlier slides which was the purpose of the ref uh one of it is to show the value. And one of the reasons why it was introduced in the first place was, a, in effect, a government requirement treasury saying, this research costs us a lot of money. What are we getting from it? Well, we, we now have, from uh, 2014, about 7,000 case studies and another X thousand from the 2021 exercise, which very clearly demonstrate the value of research to UK PLC. Um, so if you, if you just had the sort of the impact template, if you like, which was the how does your uh, department help create impact? It's not really very compelling and it was actually really quite difficult um, for the panels to assess as well. So the impact case studies are, are really good for um, persuading government to continue funding us. So I think that's really an important point. Yeah, um, I, I don't disagree with either of the comments. I think it's um, really interesting. I think the case studies are so much work. I, I don't know how to change it, um, but I think it's what we need. I, I just don't think that a dashboard of numbers is reflective across all disciplines, and I don't think it's fair to different types of research to do that, and I think we'll end up with a very commercial-focused um, research sector that will take away from a lot of the other great work that's done, so it's just not, it's not able to be done across different disciplines. Uh, absolutely. And, and sorry, one of the things I should have mentioned was uh, I had the metric tied um, on, on one of my slides. That was sort of a report back from Goodness Me 2015 now, um, which did a really in-depth uh, assessment of could the REF be replaced by metrics or could metrics be used for research assessment? And um, basically the answer was no. Um, so, um, <laughs> so, 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 so there you go. So I wouldn't go down the metrics route if you want any useful information. Um, everyone knows how amazing lead tables are, right? Thank you so much, three of you, for those answers. Um, sort of flowing on a little bit from that is culture got mentioned a few times. Um, you know, again, it's one of those really sort of nebulous words, culture. If we're talking about, um, and I think, Tamika, you mentioned we need drivers for cultural change. Um, I was just wondering if the three of you would be able to kind of talk on what you feel the most powerful driver would be for that cultural change? Hmm. I think I'll start if you like. I think that when, sorry, Simon, um, I think that when people first get into to becoming an academic, I think they have, have incredibly 
big drivers around their reasons for doing it, and that is because they're getting into something to make a difference. And I've never spoken to a to a PhD or an early career that's not in it for that reason. I think we, um, unfortunately, the research, other drivers, publish and perish, um, of winning funding and all those things, um, tend to um, remove the other drivers um, for that. Um, and I think, yeah, we, we need to do that. So I'll let uh, Simon talk there. Yeah, thanks. Now, of course, I've got, I've got a lovely anecdote, and I won't be able to remember the figures, but hopefully, you'll you'll get um, the uh, the idea from it. Um, so, yeah, uh, diversity in everything is a value, a strength. Uh, getting other people's perspectives on things always extraordinarily useful, even though you don't think it is, but then you find out that it really is. And probably one of the best examples of this um, is seatbelt. Um, design and manufacture, uh, you know, introduced in Sweden back in the 1950s and so on, and lots of research done, crash test dummies and so on. Um, did you know that a woman is seven times more likely to be injured wearing a seatbelt than a man? Um, would you be surprised to know that the reason for that uh, is because all crash test dummies until about 10 years ago were male, um, not female shaped? bodies um they about 25 years ago they thought oh actually this is something we're really well for children let's have some children but we still didn't get female ones until 10 years later uh 15 years later um so maybe if there'd been some women involved in the design of that research to start with there may have been um less uh, uh females who have had um, horrific accidents from seatbelts sorry that was probably not the best example in terms of uh, uplifting but uh, important i think so, so I think for me that I, I mentioned this a lot in my presentation. I think it's uh, surfacing values. So it's actually surfacing values in the in the research community and and acknowledging the values in, in the other communities that we're talking about when we're uh, when we're talking about impact. So I think having conversations around that kind of values level is is really important. And I think I think it's trying to tie into those internal intrinsic motivations rather than always looking at those uh, extrinsic ones like promotion and things like that. Thank you. And um, we're nearly at time, but there's one interesting question um, that flows on from this. And it's really what is funders um, role in not only driving culture change, but also in that supporting a focus on meaningful impact generation? Or is there a role for funders in that? Yeah, I mean, I'm I think... Not... Okay. So, so I think some, sometimes funders feel a little uncertain when they're moving into that space where they feel like they're leading. But, it's, but essentially, ne nearly every activity that humans undertake follows the money. Um. So, so I think I think we have you know funders have to acknowledge that that they they have that position of power um, and and use it use it wisely. So they have to they have to talk about what what is the what is the purpose, what is what is the value underpinning that purpose, uh, and and explain that in a, in a coherent way. And I think I think if that's done, because one reason I hate using the word agenda is that it feels insidious, you know, that there's some, you know, Machiavellian um, thing out there all making a change to something we don't want to be. Uh, and that, you know, that usually isn't the case. So so I think funders need to be, you know, need to front up and be honest and, and, and open, transparent, co-productive, just as we would say to, to researchers thinking about impacting in their work yeah i mean that's probably exactly what i was going to say uh i think the funders really do play an important role people are, people follow the money and or the recognition and funders provide uh both of those and there are lots of great examples um in the uk ab about funders making a change so you know 
research assessment is is one of them. Um, a lot of the open access drivers are re requirements of funders, and therefore that's been accelerated a lot in the UK because of that. A lot of the work on, on transparency um, and on integrity, uh, particularly the Wellcome Trust, been been pushing a lot on that. And and it's because uh, they're they're important funders, which a not only will either give you money or take money away, but you also you get the recognition as an individual. It's on your it's on your CV, um, and. I think most of those uh, examples I've mentioned have been very much co-created with the academic community um, and, and so there is general buy-in um, and it just gives people a reason to do the right thing rather than just relying on them to do the right thing when they're still on hour 97 in the third day of their week. I think um, in an Australian perspective, I think we still don't have enough respect for um, other alternative ways of delivering research aside from peer review publications. And peer review publications are absolutely currency. You have to do that. Uh, but I think the problem that we have here, and this has been, you know, I started in this space 10 years ago and people used to say to me, Tamika, we just don't care about knowledge translation. We're not funded for that. We don't have the skills to do it. No one's rewarded for that. And unfortunately, will I just say, we're 10 years on in my doing this and we are probably, we've moved the needle maybe 10% on that. We're talking about impact. We've moved to the other end. We've moved to the we want to assess impact um, as opposed to we want to fund you and reward you to create impact. So um, that's where I stand with the funders. I think that we've made a bit of a mistake in terms of the, the approach that we've taken. And on that, thank you so much uh, for your sharing your knowledge, your thoughts and your wisdom with us. Um, yeah, I thought that was a great um, session. Thank you so much, Tamika, Simon and Jed, particularly Simon and Jed, who have joined us at, I think it's now 11 p.m. in the UK. So thank you very much. Um, thank you very much to everyone who has joined this webinar. I am glad that there are a lot of people out there who are interested in these geeky things as I am. Um, I hope you found it useful. Um, I would encourage you to check out other um, research week activities at Monash. And with that, I will close the session. I will apologize that we haven't got to a lot of your questions. Sorry about that. Perhaps there will be a session too in our futures, um, but we will also be circulating the video shortly. So thank you very much and please join me in thanking our three fabulous speakers. Thank you so much.